Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. What a week it has been, hasn't it? A lot of random stuff, a lot of events to cover, so let's go ahead and punch through this week's Grinsome for May 5th through the 11th, 2024. Right up front, we have the Northeast region. One of the main events that occurred this week was in Pennsylvania. This was the shooting, or the rather attempted uh, church shooting in North Braddock, uh, just a uh, suburb of Pittsburgh there. This was a significant event because, again, this is something that uh, the mainstream media doesn't really like to cover, uh, but this was, uh, again, a continuation of attacks on churches and religious institutions all around the United States. Uh, this incident appears to maybe be a little bit more uh, along the lines of a mental health kind of incident sort of thing. Because a gunman walked into the church uh, and tried to shoot the pastor during a live stream of services on Sunday. Uh, guy walks into the church, points the gun at the pastor, click, uh, gun does not work, the malfunction occurs, and the congregation uh, tackles the assailant. Statements made by the assailant at the scene very sort of strongly indicate that this may have been more along the lines of a mental health care uh, kind of incident. However, uh, there was also a uh, deceased body found at the assailant's residence after he was arrested at the scene. They did a search of his home and found uh, another body of what appears to be maybe a relative. So again, this is really one of those things where there's not a whole lot of information about it. But um, again, I, I don't really want to say this is more along the lines of a, a terrorist attack. This, this appears to be more along the lines of a um, sort of random violence slash mental violence kind of kind of thing. So again, something something to, to keep note of, especially as we move forward uh, into a very chaotic uh, election season. Moving down to Washington, D.C., it has been quite the week. Uh, however, starting with one of the more simple things, there was another uh, White House gate crash back on the 4th of May, just after this uh, last week's Grinsome came out. There was a uh, White House gate crasher. Not a whole lot of information on it, but it did result in one fatality. So I'm uh, not really sure if the guy who uh, rammed into the gate uh, was deceased before or after he hit the gate or um, you know what was going on with that so hopefully we'll get some more information as time goes on but again didn't really see too many details on that moving on to the more controversial uh, idea congressional actions this week uh, oh boy it's been quite uh, quite hectic in congress and quite disturbing uh, to be perfectly honest so Again, the things that you might want to pay attention to if you are a tax-paying American are uh, the two bills that kind of came out uh, this week, or were rather introduced uh, into Congress this week, and those are uh, House Resolution 8321 and 8322. Now, again, we don't have the text of these bills, so I was hoping that by the time we got around to Saturday, we would have some more information to kind of sink our teeth into, but we don't. So unfortunately, my previous assessment still stands. Uh, I wrote a special report this week because, you know, I know the, uh, the, the longer kind of reports are not really um, super, super great sometimes, but I, I did want to kind of put a special topical update out on these uh, rather dystopian bills. So you can read it yourself. I'm not going to rehash all of what I wrote and kind of uh, talked about already uh, on these bills, but again, fairly dystopian. Uh, so again, we, we don't have much to go off of other than the statements by the, uh, the congressman who introduced the bill and the two co-sponsors. So we're going off of statements, direct first-hand primary source statements made by the people who are writing the bill. So, you know, you know, don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just telling you what they're all, what they've already said. And it's pretty, uh, pretty serious. Uh, 8321, just kind of the general gist of it, is to uh, introduce a, a law so that if anyone is convicted of a crime on a university campus, um, they are sent or, or they are sentenced to six months community service in Gaza. Uh, again, the implication of this, again, I'm not like... I'm, I'm connecting one dot to another dot. So, you know, the dots at this point are really touching each other on this particular bill and other things as well. And I feel like we need at this point to kind of use these, you know, analytical skills to maybe extrapolate some data from, you know, fairly complete sources, right? And the implication is that these uh, people who are convicted of a crime on a university campus, it doesn't say... Uh, demonstrating like we're talking about the Hamas protesters this is just as kind of like any crime right uh, 
the implication is that sending these people to Gaza, right? I think the I think the kind of implication or the the intent is for Republicans, congressional Republicans, to say, "All right, fine, these pro Hamas, uh, pro Palestine, uh, whatever label you want to put on them, these protesters at universities, they want to fight for Palestine or Hamas. Well, let's go send them there." Uh, that's kind of the kind of gotcha, you know, journalist moment that they're kind of going for with these kinds of incidents. However, that's not what it says. That's not what the bill says. It's not what the title of the bill says. And that's not the statements these guys have made. So again, something to keep in mind that this is a pretty serious implication. And honestly, if you look at the flip side of it, I'm not really sure how these congressmen are going to be able to get around providing material support to a terrorist organization. Hamas is a terrorist organization, right? They were declared as a foreign terrorist organization in 1997. So you've got three congressmen, you know, they're trying to be exceptionally pro-Israel, exceptionally anti-Palestine, yet they're providing, their, their own bill is providing material support to Hamas. So by providing them with fighters from the, you know, uh, the United States. If you want to frame it like that, you absolutely can. So again, utterly ridiculous bill, but it does kind of set the precedent for the goalposts being moved so far away from what is a cultural norm. You know, if we're now in Congress talking about deporting Americans for verbally supporting an idea, no matter how controversial that idea is, or whether it's right or wrong, doesn't really matter. If they're verbally supporting an idea, not providing materiel support, again, not providing materiel support, that's already illegal. Okay, unlawful assembly, already illegal, trespassing, already illegal, property damage, already illegal. We're not talking about that. We're talking about verbal support for a questionable organization, idea, whatever, okay? If we're now, if the goalposts are now that we're going to start deporting these people to the Middle East with the intent of getting them killed by American bombs, you know, pardon me for being a little bit concerned about that. So again, I said what I said in this special report. I know a lot of people didn't agree with it or don't like it, uh, but hey, you know, I, I feel like I'm not really going that far above what's already been kind of said by the congressmen themselves. So again, very concerning. Um, I don't really know what to do about it, uh, but I feel like not enough people are concerned about it because so many people, again, with this Gaza, Palestine, Israel kind of situation, they're so desperate to jump into one support side or the other, and they they just don't understand that, or they don't really care uh, that some very, very serious goalposts are being shoved into the ground, and um, I don't know how we're going to uh, recover from, from stuff like this. So, again, I don't think it's going to pass, but who knows? So, uh, huge, huge, huge concern. So, uh, I guess we'll just have to wait. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what the text of the bill is. My guess is that they probably just introduced it for a political grandstanding event and then they'll walk it back in the text of the bill, but I don't know. I would really love to walk things back and not be as concerned, but again, that hasn't happened. So uh, we'll just have to kind of play it by ear and, and see how this works out. So again, sorry for ranting and raving too long on that. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and move on to the next region which is the West Central Midwestern region. One incident this week, which I did not highlight in the wire report, uh, I got left out in favor of uh, time constraints, but this is important. And I didn't have enough time to verify it until, until just now. Uh, really, it's kind of gone public that there has been a massive cyber attack at the Ascension Hospital uh, healthcare system, right? So we're talking around, I've seen reports saying 120 to 140 hospitals were directly affected by a cyber attack. No details of what the cyber attack was, or I take it back. There, there are details, but nothing that's really solid to kind of like sink your teeth into. Uh, however, over 40 assisted, uh, health, assisted care facilities were also affected by this uh, cyber attack. So again, when it comes to cyber attacks and hospitals, you have to realize the dynamic at play here. Uh, when it comes to critical infrastructure in general, you may see a system go down. You may see like a um, uh, some kind of company or system or something like be offline for maintenance. And then we find out a few days later that it was a cyber attack because they didn't want to admit to it right up front. They wanted to kind of solve the issue first. Um, because it's one of those things where they're just trying to kind of keep things on the down low while they're working, they're working the issue, uh, which I kind of understand to some degree. But again, it, it took me a, about a day to kind of um, drill down 
uh, on this. But I did get a lot of uh, DMs about this, so I did want to uh, thank you all for that, uh, giving me the kind of the heads up on this very suspicious kind of incident. Moving over to Western Europe, we have really two big kind of issues or s sort of concentrations of demonstrations this week. Again, protests and demonstrations and riots and civil unrest continues all over Europe, in pretty much every nation in Europe, uh, except for like Russia or Ukraine for obvious reasons. But this week we really have concentrations of, um, I guess you should say, angry sentiment uh, in Ireland and in the Netherlands. So, so the riots or unrest, however you want to phrase it, I'm really struggling to kind of figure out, is this more of a riot or is this a demonstration or is this like a seriously kinetic thing? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. So let's go ahead and start with Ireland. So this week, the really the unrest in Ireland has come from counter-immigration protests. So uh, again, last week, one of the uh, immigration welcoming centers, um, basically, that has been enabling a lot of immigration uh, throughout Ireland uh, was burned down in Dublin. And interestingly enough, a lot of the uh, locals were able to kind of talk to the construction crews who were trying to fix or, or brought in to, to repair the, the destroyed facility and the locals were able to talk them out of it. So again, these little little tiny things don't really make the media are, are something that's very, very interesting to me uh, because now you start seeing people um, counteracting some of these very, very dystopian you know ideas uh, kind of thrust upon the Western world these days. You see them starting to move around and, and and realize that, okay, well, protests are, are helpful in some cases and not, and in some cases they're not. But there's definitely multiple avenues of approach now for uh, countering a lot of these demonstrations, talking to people, you know, getting people to realize your side of the issue instead of just going out there and shouting, you know, with a sign in your hand. Very interesting, very interesting idea. Uh, however, this has resulted in a lot of unrest in Dublin. Some of the largest protests we've actually seen in Dublin in a long time have been about uh, this immigration issue. So it'll be interesting to see how that kind of shakes out because as we all know, Ireland, uh, even the ROI has, has a very interesting history. And um, I think it's very, very safe to say that the Irish people have had enough uh, of, of all this stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Uh, uh, across the channel over in the Netherlands, Amsterdam saw quite a bit of rioting and uh, very, very kinetic activity, I should say. Even uh, for European standards, it's, it's more kinetic from American standards, it's, it, it maybe not be so much. Uh, but in Amsterdam, there were quite a few demonstrations of really starting since last weekend, I think, and then they've just kind of continued over the week. They got kind of hot a couple of days ago. Uh, but the issues that they're writing about are hard to determine. Most of the demonstrations in the Netherlands are from a like politically leftist kind of you know perspective. So when we see a lot of leftist demonstrations, even in the United States, we see them kind of ideologically capture a lot of ideas in one. So you'll see demonstrators in the same group of protesters holding signs that are opposing each other. So it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes, and that's kind of what I've seen happen uh, in Amsterdam. So you've got, you know, climate protesters in the same group with pro-Palestinian protesters. And then you've got, you know, uh, pro-Israeli protesters kind of you know, in the mix somewhere. So it's like you've got a lot of cognitive dissonance in the same group. Um, you know, it's one of those things that tends to happen sometimes. It, it does happen sometimes with conservative groups as well, but... Lately, it's really been a lot of these leftist groups because um, when you look at the actual individual protester, right, a lot of times you'll see one protester being paid uh, because, this, again, the, the left is really the only uh, political like center which pays protesters a lot of times. So you'll see the same protester be arrested at a BLM rally. On the other side of the country, you'll see them arrested for a pro-Palestine rally. And then, you know, in the Midwest, you'll see them arrested for some kind of climate agenda thing. And then you'll see them arrested for the... So they're, they're, they're going from protest to protest to protest. And a lot of times you'll see just kind of conglomerations form. So again, some of these things tend to happen in the more politically liberal cities or like liberal um, strongholds throughout Europe. You don't tend to see it happen, you know, in small towns in the south of France so much, but, you know, in, you know, pretty big powerhouse cities like Amsterdam, you do kind of see this happen. So, again, something interesting to take note of is, you know, if you're out there, you're just, you're shopping around for political ideology to kind of support, you, you just kind of have to realize 
uh, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily that organic and you might be you know you know hitching your wagon to a, a horse that uh isn't really going anywhere so again something to keep in mind and switching gears quite significantly let's talk a little bit about this sort of french foreign legion fiasco uh, with regards to france and ukraine so i put out a wire report i think monday or tuesday or something like that talking about how a lot of media groups had put out uh, a report or they were, they, were kind of, they were kind of like leaking the story through defense attaches that the French Foreign Legion was going to be deploying a couple of battalions or maybe not even a couple of battalions, just, you know, uh, 1,500 or so uh, troops to Ukraine. Well, uh, that turns out, to, well, France at least, France at least says that's false. That's not true. They never plan to do that. Case closed, right? I think there's more to the story, but I have absolutely no evidence uh, other than my own knowledge of how things are working in Ukraine. Uh, with regards to how many NATO troops are there and sending the French Foreign Legion to Ukraine, I think they've already done it. That's, I have no evidence to suggest so, but I think they've already done it. I think the French Foreign Legion, as far as uh, leadership, maybe artillery spotters, maybe intelligence, definitely intelligence for sure. I think basically every single military in NATO and every single like uniquely French organization like the French Foreign Legion uh, nations that have these kind of uniquely national sort of entities, they've been rotating them through Ukraine like, like we used to do in Afghanistan. You know, like Afghanistan was basically the train, training test bed for really NATO uh, with regards to technology, personnel, all kinds of stuff. You know, walking around Bagram just a few years ago, you see like, what uniform is that? What flag is that? Like, are they even in NATO? Like, why is Nepal here in Bagram? Like, you know, are the Nepalese Gurkhas, what are they doing here, you know? So it's like, you see this kind of thing happen, and I'm sure that in Ukraine the same thing's happening, except nobody's wearing uniforms, nobody's wearing flags on their sleeves. It's all done very quietly. So, when these reports broke, here's what I think happened. My personal opinion, no evidence to suggest it whatsoever. I think a bunch of Russian sources, probably the old GRU guys, or somebody, or FSB, or whoever, got wind of this, pushed it through their cronies, uh, in the media and said, oh, hey, uh, the French are, are deploying to, to Ukraine. You got to remember how Russian disinformation and, and like genuine Russian psyops work. They're not very good at it. Okay. They're, they're, they're really not. I don't, you know, again, probably opinion that nobody agrees with, but you look at Russian propaganda and from a neutral, non-military industrial complex, non-RAND uh, style of thinking, and you look at the Russian propaganda and you're like, was this like was this their effort this is all they got anyway what i think happened is the russians got wind of uh, probably an email or two because they probably tapped the communications of all these french officials they probably got wind of it somebody trying to think about it and then they push it through their cronies before waiting the russians can't hold their wad when it comes to propaganda a lot of times so my guess is they probably pushed it out and now France says, oh, well, show us your evidence. Well, we don't have any. It was an email that was classified, and the Russians are sa and will say, well, we, we're not going to give our sources and methods up. Anyway, for people like me, it makes me look like an idiot uh, because, you know, I run with the story. You know, that's my fault for not kind of like, you know, double checking that. But it's like, or double or triple checking that. But it's like, man, you know, this, they're kind of wily. Plus, you also have, you know, sh sheer and utter criminal negligence and incompetence being you know the the french defense industry right now especially macron like i mean good grief one day he's saying french the french army is going to be deploying to ukraine if need be the next day he's saying i never said that you know or you took me out of context it's like so what is it going to be like give it three days and i guarantee you we're, we'll, we'll be talking about the french foreign legion in ukraine again um, because militarily speaking that would probably be smart for macron to do from his perspective militarily speaking it's only reinforcing a defeat, but it seems like every NATO member is tripping over their own defense budgets to uh, see how much money they can lose and how many lives they can lose in Ukraine. But anyway, again, I know this is probably a very, very minority uh, opinion, but, you know, I think that uh, we're going to be learning a lot of things. Just wait 10, 15 years and what we learn from the Ukraine war will be um, very, very interesting uh, to read in the history book. So again... France says the French Foreign Legion not going to Ukraine, but all things considered, that's probably not true, but I don't have any evidence to, to prove that it's not. So 
Um, any case, in any case, uh, that's all I got on that one. So let's go ahead and move on to the Southern Europe Mediterranean region. And again, uh, what's going on in Israel is exceptionally geopolitically hot right now. It is impossible to talk about Israel, Gaza, without getting um, not so much censored by like platforms like YouTube or, or whatnot, but it's like you get censored by other people uh, who, who have a very, they're looking at this conflict through a soda straw and it's very, very hard to get people to kind of think, think outside the box with regards to this sort of thing. Um, you know, I wrote my thoughts on, on what's going on with the, with the latest peace deal in Israel, but again, I don't think a whole lot of people kind of agree with the idea, despite, you know, I, I kind of forget sometimes that what may be extremely obvious to me may not be so for other people. So that's my fault. You know, sorry for not taking that into consideration a lot, but the bottom line with what's going on in Israel at the moment with Rafa is peace talks have kind of collapsed. Uh, this time, it looks like it was probably due to Israel's actions. It looks to me, and this, again, Israeli media is kind of talking about this, so the people who are most likely to censor it are saying it's, it's obvious to them, you know, that it seems like Hamas was probably willing to, you know, uh, make a fairly generous peace deal with Israel just to kind of stop this this bloodshed, right? Hamas is claiming, you know, believe them if you want or, or don't believe them if you want. It's up to you. I'm just a messenger. Hamas is claiming that they basically agreed to everything Israel wanted and Israel walked away from the table uh, and within a few hours they were already in Rafah. So uh, even Israeli media is saying, hey, wait a minute, something's up with this. So it looks to me like um, old Bibi over there is probably trying to keep his government alive, trying to keep his own uh, political office intact by bringing forth a peace deal that uh, he knew Hamas would reject, all right? You know, it's classic, classic diplomatic tactic, not just, it's not something in uniquely Israeli either. Classic diplomatic tactic, you bring a peace deal that you know your enemy is going to reject, like, you know, unconditional surrender or something like that, they're going to reject that. And then when they do reject that, you can have justification to invade. Well, they didn't do that, right? They called as well. They said, yeah, oh, we'll, we'll, we will agree to your ridiculous proposal. And uh, BB said, well, we're walking away from the table and then invaded Rafa because he really wanted an, a justification to invade Rafa and take control of the Philadelphia corridor, which I personally think is not so much a slide against Gaza, but a slide against Egypt, right? I think Israel's trying to flex their muscle with regards to two countries at the moment, Egypt and Lebanon. Um, but so, so this goes beyond Gaza. Uh, but again, very, very politically charged issue, very, very hard to kind of convey a neutral perspective in this, especially when the conflict in some ways is so extremely one-sided, you know, uh, like from a targeting perspective, like, look, you know, pointing out that, look, just go buy JP360 and look at all of the stuff that is that is being violated there, you know, and it's like, hey, I, you know, we can't, we can't keep ignoring this stuff for, for much, for too much longer. And even the White House, even during interviews is, is, is no longer able to kind of deny this sort of thing. So, uh, again, I shouldn't have to say this, but denouncing specific actions of one side in a conflict does not mean you're supporting the other side. You know, I shouldn't have to say that, but I guess I do. So anyway, I just thought I would point that out. And then wrapping things up, I thought I would do something a little bit different uh, and add in some of the news reports that all of you have been able to send in or send out rather through the GhostNet. So again, for those of you who are probably not aware of what the GhostNet is, you can check out some of the other videos I've done on this. Basically, this is an HF radio communications plan, um, mostly for uh, you know amateur radio uh, guys and things like that. But... The way that we've set it up is so that you can send short and sweet information or news reports from your local area and a lot of other people can receive it. So I thought this would be kind of a little fun little exercise to see which kinds of reports uh, I myself picked up throughout the week. And to make it extra challenging, as we all know, uh, there's no real person to person here. So it's you're sending information reports to the ghost net. So uh, I'm giving you criteria, you know, to send news reports to the ghost net like call sign on JS8 call and stuff like that but you're not sending them directly to me right it's only happenstance that I can pick these up so you're not going to know you're basically sending out random reports and hoping that I receive it here personally 
Uh, I may receive it, I may not. It's a fun little exercise, right? And it kind of gets us in the mindset of thinking, well, you may have to exchange information with people who you don't know and in a contingent situation, but you want to be as safe as you can about it, right? So nobody knows my call sign. It's not out there in the public. I'm just like all of you, right? Engaging in the ghost net and sharing information and exchanging things. And if I receive a report, good. If I don't, you know, um, there's no real way to kind of make that happen. So again, for all the hams out there who are like trying to like, what's your call sign so I can send you a report? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Send it to the ghost net tag and maybe, maybe I'll pick it up. But anyway, uh, I did get one report this week, which I thought was interesting. And it kind of, again, along with a few direct messages, because I did not see this in the media at all. Like nowhere in my, in my little, you know, rabbit hole kind of information sources did I see the Ascension Health uh, cyber attack uh, incident. I got it from two or three of you uh, DM'd it to me. So I'm sorry if I didn't respond to all of you, uh, but thank you for that. Uh, but I also saw it. I'm not sure if there's some, if the one of you who DM'd it to me uh, also transmitted it, but I got your report. I got your report, brother. So uh, I did see that pop up on JSA call this week. I was going to take a screenshot, but then I I forgot about it. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out that, hey, this, this is the kind of thing that this is what this is for. So it's for localized reporting, stuff that I don't talk about necessarily, but it's a way to kind of show what people are putting in and it allows you to have a little bit of an incentive to, to maybe realize that you never really know who's watching out there on the ghost net. And uh, if you're trying to uh, really do some good, good local news reporting or intel reporting, whatever you want to call it, and you're pushing that out and you're trying to help people and you're trying to share good information, this is a good way to do it because you never know who might be watching and you might... Uh, get a little bit of recognition from a local issue uh, in some of these uh, news reports that I do here, uh, like the Grinsome. So that's pretty much all I have. Again, here are your sources for this week. Uh, I, I'm sorry if it's a little bit random this week. It's, it's been kind of a hectic week. I've had uh, several power outages this week to kind of deal with and kind of uh, test my own little um, power outage plans and such. So, so hopefully everyone out there has a good weekend. We'll get back to it with the standard wire reports on, on Monday. And we will see you then. So thank you all for watching and we'll see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.